Our penultimate speaker for today is Ben Campbell, who will speak about raising cattle in a sustainable, regenerative, agricultural manner and the effect that that has on the land. Now, interestingly, Ben is an engineer, but he turned third-generation rancher, so he's the real cowboy, not me, uh, and ranches on the very land his grandfather farmed when he immigrated from Scotland. Please help me in joining welcoming, and sorry, <laughs> blip, blip, blip. Please join me in welcoming Ben Campbell. Hello, thanks for having me, it's great to be here. So like you said, I was, um, <clears throat> I don't normally tell people that I'm an engineer, usually try to keep it under wraps. I, uh, I'm a runaway engineer, so I, I had, have an engineering degree, but I worked, this is a little loud, I'm gonna pull that away. Is that better? Yeah. I don't want to be deafening anyone. So I worked as, an, as a uh, volunteer for Engineers Without Borders in uh, Zambia, in Southern Africa. And uh, I, I just, my goal when I finished university was I wanted to have a positive impact uh, on the world. I wanted the world to be uh, a better place. And I didn't know how to do that. So when I came back uh, to Canada, I was, was searching. I spent a year uh, I didn't want to commit to anything, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And a friend of mine told me about ranching. I, didn't, I grew up on an acreage uh, on the family farm, but I was in no way involved in agriculture. And uh, a friend of mine told me about a, uh, grazing cattle as a way of uh, being a conservationist and preserving ecosystems. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Um, I'd like to see how you can do that. So I started with four animals. I had a job in Calgary at the time as an engineer, and so I would work as an engineer in the day, and then in the evening, uh, work as a rancher. Um, I'm gonna talk about what, so this is a picture of cattle on my place last summer. Um, I'm gonna talk about what we are conserving. So what we're conserving, actually where we live is just southwest of Calgary. Uh, and it's sort of at the, uh, the uh, meeting point of two ecological regions, which is the grasslands and the uh, Aspen Parkland. So those are the eco-regions that we're, we're conserving. What they are are really um, diverse. So they're ranked um, on a, uh, the highest level for biodiversity. Uh, they're also ranked on the uh, highest level for threat and they're also ranked on the lowest level for protection. So we talk about Amazon rainforest or coral reefs uh, in uh, Australia for being threatened, vibrant ecosystems. But here we have um, some of the most threatened ecosystems on the planet. The grasslands ecosystem is 70% destroyed. The um, Aspen Parkland ecosystem is 80% destroyed. Um, and it's not like when you convert 80% of something, you necessarily still have 20%. Like for example, if I took all of the food, 80% of all of your food away, I wouldn't just have 20% of each person, everybody would die. So there's things like uh, sage grouse and they need 75% of their land to be native grassland or they can't survive. They, it can't just be, um, okay, well, we have 25%, so we'll just have 25% as many birds. You'll just have zero. And so we're seeing a massive, a massive decline in, in populations of wildlife. So like up to 90% loss of wildlife. So skipping ahead, actually. So these are some of the things. These are photos on our place. These are some of the things we're conserving. On the top, that wasp, top left is a wasp. Um, I should have forgot a stump stabber wasp. And so what, it's amazing. So why do I want, why do I care? Like why would I die, uh, devote my entire life to conserving these things? I think nature is amazing. I think the planet is amazing. I just am like a child in awe of everything. So that, that's a wasp, it's a stump stabber and I actually got a photo of it uh, injecting an egg through an ovipositor. So what it does is it taps on the dead wood. It finds a, a beetle grub under the wood and then it injects its ovipositor into the grub and lays a parasitic egg that eats the worm from the inside out and then hatches. Unbelievable. <laughs> They're actually so smart, they eat it, it's pretty sad, non-vital organs first so that they're not sitting in a dead body. They, it's pretty, 
We have those here, they exist. Thank goodness they're not bigger. <laughs> we, we also, on the right, top right, that's a wetland that we have, so we conserve. You see we have a fence around it, and there's a birdhouse. That's a birdhouse for tree nesting ducks, which we have lots of here. So the, the, the fencing does a lot of things. It prevents um, cattle from stomping in the water and defecating and urinating in the water. Um, there's gonna be ducks that have nests in the grass. Uh, there's also gonna be frogs and salamanders, and they don't stomp on any of those things. It makes the water cleaner for the cattle to drink. Um, and it also provides a buffer when we get a heavy rainstorm, we don't have manure washing straight into the water. On the bottom left, that's a pair of native bumblebees on a native grassland reproducing. Um, bees, as we know, are uh, in trouble, and people say, oh, we should help bees, we should get beehives. We don't have any beehives on our farm because those are European honeybees. So that's sort of like saying, you know, tigers are in decline, so let's release a bunch of house cats, and that will save, like, that's not the same thing <laughs> at all. <laughs> so bees are important because, native bees are important because native bees have particular biology to pollinate native plants, and so European honeybees can't, can't do that. And then that's a little brown bat. Their population's in drastic decline. Um, it, it, it's, I rotated it so it's nicer for our human eyes, but it's actually upside down in the picture and just sunning itself. So what we do, this is a picture of how, how so I guess I can talk about what I, what I conserve, what I do. This is how I do it. So on the left, far left, that's a photo of, uh, people say, why do you like taking pictures of your gloves on the ground so much? <laughs> it's for scale, and I put my foot in there for scale too. So that's on the far left, that's where I unrolled a bale, a hay bale in the spring and fed my cattle. The photo in the middle is farther away from that. That's what it looked like before I unrolled the bale, so bare dirt. And then the photo on the far right shows how far apart those two spots are, just to prove that I didn't just take a photo of a desert and then go take a photo of a nice grassland. So that's the kind of impact that we can have, the quality of impact that we can have with cattle. Um, and it shouldn't really be surprising because grasses evolved with cattle and cattle evolved with grasses. And it's an it's a ecosystem that works together. And so there's lots of studies you know, in the mountains and stuff. People say, we don't want cattle in the mountains. They're, they're gonna ruin it. They're gonna overgraze. Well, for sure they can, but if managed properly, they actually create an explosion of biodiversity where they graze and where you see places where there's no grazing, you get really tall grass, but it's actually just one species of grass. It's a monoculture and monocultures are not natural. So um, well, one of the ways I explain that is we have like, I think 50 species of dung beetles in Alberta. And what is a dung beetle without dung? We have cowbirds. What's a cowbird without cows? We have a lot of things that work in a symbiotic or a close relationship dependent on each other. So I think I'm just gonna play a, just a one minute video. When we do get rain, my fields absorb more rain. So you'll see my fields will be very green and overgrazed fields will be very brown and very short. So that's a photo, an aerial photo, my field on the left and a neighbor's field on the right, and so what I would call good management, and then poor management. It's not his fault, it, it's, he rents it, and I, it's not about who's better, it's just that what the effect, the positive effect that cattle can have on the landscape. So you would look at the one on the, on the right and you would say, oh, you know, this is, this is uh, poor quality land, um, or this is, we didn't get enough rain, and then you look at the one on the left and you say, well, wait a minute, what, you know, how did this happen? And what happened was uh, when the glaciers came through this area 10, 15,000 years ago, they scraped off all the topsoil. I don't know if you know this, but we don't have earthworms here naturally. Only in a tiny, tiny spot in Alberta are there any natural earthworms at all. When the glaciers came by, they scraped off all the topsoil, including all of the worms, and bison and large herds of large ruminants rebuilt it. So they built these vibrant ecosystems through grazing. Um, here's a picture on the left. So this is, um, the top left is uh, water in the water trough. So this is how we water cattle. This is a native grassland, and then we use a solar panel to pump water up into a trough. So you can see all the tall grass around the pond. And the water, <laughs> I was tempted to drink it. That's stagnant water. That's not like from a, from a flowing stream. That's stagnant water in a slough. And look at how clean it is. So that's, that's a, a really life-giving water. Um, 
it, it's, it, what we're doing, I guess, is we're mimicking nature. So cattle and bison are not the exact same, but they're extremely similar. They're actually so similar that they can interbreed, and the, if the niche, ecological niche that they have is, is very similar. So we could do the same thing with bison as we do with cattle. Uh, it doesn't matter. We're just, the cattle are, I consider myself a conservationist. I, can, I consider the farm uh, like a national park, and I'm just like a park ranger. And so I'm just managing the ecosystem, and the cattle are one of the tools that I use to manage the ecosystem. So the point of the ranch isn't to make as much money as possible or make beef or anything like that. The point of the ranch is to be a vibrant, healthy ecosystem that uh, can withstand different things like droughts and heat and cool and snowstorms in May like we like to get. <laughs> so... Um, there's two, two ways that we can conserve these grasslands. One is through the health. And so like this photo will show you, we can serve the health of the ecosystem um, by making it healthier, by grazing. So we, we do um, high density rotational grazing. So the way the bison grazed was they would eat and then they would move uh, and they wouldn't come back to the same spot. They would trample it and defecate and urinate and stomp it all into the ground and just make a huge mess of it. Uh, and then they wouldn't come back for like a year or two years, and so we do that same thing where we have cattle moving every single day on the ranch, and they don't come back to the same spot for, depending on the time, we might come back t twice in a year or once on only, and sometimes ne not at all in a year. So we're sharing the ecosystem with the wildlife. So one thing that's sort of, that's what's unique about it is we have, we don't shoot predators, like we have coyotes and grizzly bears and black bears and um, mountain lions and badgers, uh, and it's all part of an ecosystem that balances each other. So when I wake up in the morning, instead of killing things, like I have too many gophers, I need to kill the gophers. And then, uh, you know, I have to kill, I've got too many weeds, I need to kill the weeds. I just want to make things live. So I say, okay, I've got a lot of gophers right now, maybe two, maybe more than I want. So I'm going to make this a good ecosystem for badgers. And then I wait for a badger to come in and then badgers will clean out a lot of the gophers. And uh, so we have hawks and hawks will eat gophers. So if I poison the gophers, I poison the predators and we have a broken ecosystem. So we're trying to have a, a healthy ecosystem that manages itself. Um, the other thing that we do to conserve, one is to conserve the health, the other one is to conserve that it even exists. And that field on the right, the brown one, um, now it's actually, believe it or not, it's gotten substantially worse. Uh, it's been cultivated and it's growing grain and I'm not against grain farming at all. I mean, I eat bread and cereal and things like that. I, I'm not against grain farming in any way, but uh, what we're doing is we're losing habitat to farming. And it could be, you know, potatoes or whatever, but people say, well, we should switch to a purely vegetarian diet because cattle are bad for the environment. Um, and what happens is if you take that field on the right uh, and you cultivate it, you're going to cultivate it and spray it and uh, fertilize it. And it's, it's sort of removed from the ecosystem. Like there's not going to be gophers there. There are lots of birds nest on the ground. There's not going to be any birds nesting on the ground. There's not going to be any badgers living in that field, it's exclusively for humans. And the field on the left, the green one, has ground nesting birds, and it's got bugs and underground uh, animals, and it's got deer and all sorts of things that eat and rely on those plants. So with cattle, we're able to share the environment, and if we are cu cultivating it we and converting it into cropland, that's what's happening and how we've converted so much already, 70% of grasslands and 80% of, of Aspen Parkland, we're completely removing that from the ecosystem. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, I was just on a, a panel with the European Union. I was, of course, in the Canadian delegation talking about trade and um, climate change is a really big thing that they're talking about. And a lot of people talk about cattle are bad for the environment and we should get rid of cattle uh, and they produce methane and we should stop having cattle. Um, as we know, of course, uh, if things are in balance, there used to be bison in North America. If things are in balance, um, they stay equal. And when we tip things out of the scale, that's sort of where we start to, to lose track of things. And so soil holds carbon in the form of organic matter, like I'm organic matter. And we, it's a really funny name to call it organic matter, but the soil has a lot of organic matter. That's why it's black. If you don't have organic matter, it looks like gray if it's, if it's clay or it could be just like plain sand. Um, and when you cultivate that organic matter, 
it's a structure in the soil. And so you can imagine, you say, well, we just, all we did was we just cultivated it. It's still all there. But if you took a, a bulldozer and you ran it through this building right now, all of the materials are still here afterwards, but they're not really functional anymore. <laughs> That's what happens when you cultivate soil is it breaks down. And so what you have is a massive release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So you could have soil um, where it's 15% organic matter and it can be reduced through continuous cu cultivation down to five. So, okay, well, what does that mean? Um, it could mean 15 tons of carbon per hectare. So, you know, you do 1,000 hectares of that, it's 15,000 tons of carbon released. And 1,000 hectares is really not that big of a farm. So it really matters by conserving things. The other, the last thing I wanted to point out is the difference between uh, biogenic carbon, and so that's like carbon, like when I breathe in or eat, let's say I eat a loaf of bread and then I breathe out, that's biogenic carbon. Uh, and non-biogenic is like fossil fuels. We extract something from the ground, like the last presenter was talking about coal, or coal and we burn it, and then that's in the atmosphere, and they're very different. Um, cattle can live in that, well, they can actually, cattle can occupy both, it depends. If cattle are in, in an ecosystem and they're playing a niche role in an ecosystem, um, they're part of that biogenic. So if they're out on pasture playing the role of bison, they're part of the biogenic. If you take them off and you put them in a feedlot and then you grow a crop and then you bring the crop and feed it to the cows, they're separate from an ecosystem. And so then they transition into adding carbon to the atmosphere. So blanket statements, I'm gonna make a blanket statement about blanket statements because I like irony. <laughs> blanket <laughs> statements are always wrong. So. <laughs> You can't say that cattle are bad for the environment and you can't say that cattle are fundamentally good for the environment. If you have cattle in an ecological role, I think they're good for the environment. They're playing a keystone species role in keeping that ecosystem healthy. If you go to the Amazon rainforest and you clear cut the rainforest and you grow soybeans and then you build a feedlot and then you feed the soybeans to the cattle in the feedlot, no, okay, those aren't good for the environment. So it depends, like many things in life. Uh, and so this is sort of like um, just... To keep, uh, we are not, when I was on this European Union panel there, they were not differentiating between um, biogenic and non-biogenic carbon. And I, I raised my hand and I said, I think we need to maybe just make sure we're talking about the right things here. Uh, and they said, no, we're not really interested in talking about that. And so the, <laughs> the reason that that matters is, <laughs> is if I took, uh, if I went to the bank in the morning and I withdrew $1,000 every day, and then at the end of the day, I deposited $1,000 back into my account, and then I just, instead of looking at my whole account, I just focused on deposits. And I said, look how much money I'm making. That doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> and so the way that cattle work in an ecosystem is there's grass and the grass grows this time of year. It's absorbing carbon out of the air. That's how we make carbon bodies is carbon dioxide from the air absorbs into the grass. The grass turns it into a physical body and now the carbon is stored in the grass, and then the cattle eat that physical body, and then they breathe it out, or they comes out the other end, <laughs> and it comes out as carbon, and a bunch of it goes into the soil and is, and is stable in the soil, and some goes back into the air. But the car you can't increase the carbon atmospheric carbon levels by removing carbon from the atmosphere and then putting it back. That's part of a cycle, so it's not possible to, to increase the, the atmospheric carbon level. And I really believe we should be fighting climate change very strongly. That's one of the big, most biggest reasons I'm doing what I'm doing, is to fight climate change. Uh, but we can't do it if we're not doing it effectively. Um, so then if we said, okay, well, if you looked at that po portion and you said, well, cattle are bad for the environment, that field, this one on the right now, is going to be growing um, barley to be fed to cattle in a feedlot. Um, and so you, they, they cultivate it up, there's a tractor burning diesel, we're having synthetic fertilizers which pr produce and release a lot of atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases. That's now a huge emitter of greenhouse gases, but it's a vegetarian crop. You know, we could be producing wheat and uh, it's a purely vegetarian crop. So we have to be very careful about how we, we do things. I'm not against in any way crop farming or eating vegetables. I eat lots myself, but we just have to be careful which, which ways, what ways we uh, address that and tackle that because um, we're in a really blessed, unique position in North America uh, on these grasslands that cattle can fill an ecological role and, and actually make the environment healthier and stronger and more diverse and more climate change resilient. So now I'm gonna um, open it up for some questions. Thank you.
Bill, Bill, over to you. Yeah, Bill Skinner from Calgary Heritage Park. If what I'm reading as grass-fed beef is good beef and feedlot beef is less good beef, what proportion of Canada's beef supply could be maintained if you only had grass-fed beef growing like you do? Yeah, so there, there actually are studies around that. Um, and we can produce uh, a large volume of grass. There's, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of nuance to that question. So for example, if we go, I'm just gonna, this slide's a good one just because it shows one thing and the other. Um, so the field on the left is not receiving, that's my field, is not receiving any fertilizer. The field on the right is gonna receive like 100 pounds of, if it's a crop for barley to feed cattle, it's gonna receive like 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre plus you know, 50 pounds of phosphorus and all these other fertilizers. So they're being sort of, they're more productive, but they're also more productive as a result of being heavily fertilized. If you grazed cattle on that, you would actually produce a huge amount of beef. But there's studies that you could produce a lot of beef. We have way, way more beef than we could ever eat. Everyone could eat a pure beef diet and no fruits or vegetables in Canada. We would easily be able to supply that. We have so much beef, we export the vast majority to the world. And beef is not, the volumes that we eat are not necessary for survival. So it's totally possible to do, to do grass-fed. We had almost the same number of cattle uh, or bison in North America before Europeans came. So we have the, the land base and the ecosystems to support huge herds of grazers. Uh, Tim Anderson from Calgary West. Uh, your talk absolutely inspired me and it scared me at the same time. When you talk about the 80% loss of the, uh, of the soil and or 80% loss of the aspen forest, 70% loss of the soil, you're doing such great work who else is doing this? What's your hope for the future if there's so few people doing that? And by the way, I'm vegetarian, so I hope the rest of you guys will eat lots of beef to support the industry properly. <laughs> That's great. So there's a th regenerative agriculture was sort of an unheard of term not too long ago. Uh, and there's... Um, I go to a regenerative agri it's not I, I go to a regenerative agriculture conference and it's really not like I'm this picture and maybe I should put this picture away it's not against anything like I'm not against feedlots I just think that we can minimize the amount of time cattle spend in their lives there and we can maybe maximize the efficiency of what we're doing I'm not against crop farming at all these um, this conference I went to um, every year they have to look for a new venue because it sells out. And that conference is attended by 600, 500, then 600, then 700 ranchers and grain farmers uh, together. So there's, there's a, it's a really growing thing. There's a lot of people that care about the environment. The other thing that's great is it's not, it's not a trade-off. Like, well, if we do something that's good for the environment, then it's really bad for our finances and everyone's going to go broke. No, regenerative agriculture is actually much more productive because it's better at... Ca so one of the big things it does is a, you, it makes your land healthy. You absorb rain. So when you get... It's dry like this, and then we get a huge thunderstorm, which happens. Instead of the water running off your land and flooding in rivers, it absorbs into the land. So the increased organic matter increases water absorption, the speed that water can come into the soil. It also increases how much water it can hold. So if you had a square like this, you can hold a big volume of water versus a small volume, and that helps protect against long periods of drought. There's lots of regenerative agriculture is a, is a very fast growing thing, and it's not just in beef, it's in crop farming as well. There's, they do cover crops and multi-species cropping. It's really exciting. Do you have time for one more? Yes. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm excited to say I'm also the successor of a 100-year-old farm, um, so we also have native grassland. And I want to know, what has been your biggest challenge? Like, what am I needing to look out for? Because I am on the same path. Oh, I don't know, the biggest challenge? I don't, people always ask me that, and like my biggest mistakes, but I'm really an optimist, and I don't dwell on mistakes. Like, uh, when I make a mistake, I go, okay, well, that didn't work, and then I try something new, and then it works, and then I'm really happy with what worked, and I replicate that, and it goes, so, I don't know. Uh, uh, pay a, just pay attention, I think, is the biggest thing you can do. Native grasslands are like, I, you can never name all the species of everything that exists. I want to cry. I try not to. I get so emotional. It's the last thing I say. I think I'll close by saying this is it, we are not separate from the world. If the world suffers, we suffer. And on our ranch, on our national park, the, it supports it supports a family of humans, and uh, we're a part of it. And uh, that's why I care. 
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So if that does not uh, create a bit of a tear and show passion for someone who's doing what they truly believe in. The shelter box donation on behalf of Ben was sponsored by the Rotary Club of Cochrane. <laughs> or, sorry, Calgary, Calgary, Calgary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.